to fight, we'll do it right with no apology. Four gay San Franciscans, the choral majority, sing a political protest song laced with satire, a song that certainly will offend some Americans. On Market Street, more than a quarter of a million people celebrate, each in his own way, the homosexual lifestyle and the struggle to protect it. Every summer, the Gay Freedom Day Parade marches toward the city's center of political power, a sight that clearly does not please the millions of Americans who have little sympathy with homosexuality. On the surface, this is a joyous festival of diversity, but the outward jubilation hides real fears among gays that the gains they have made could be jeopardized. For in San Francisco, and even more so outside the city, gays face discrimination, rejection, harassment, and hostility, much as they have for centuries. They lived here all our lives. No, they take over don't... every other place, Russian River, Castro Street, they got all that. Why they got to come down Diamond here and Hyde. take over here? When you're out like around Castro or something, I mean, all the queers are out there in their little, you know, tight jeans and stuff. Just too blatant. With such attitudes widespread, you might expect straight politicians to keep their distance from the gay community. Instead, they ride in gay parades and court favor. These office seekers know what they're doing. Fears among gays for their own safety and freedom have made the gay community a bubbling political cauldron of grassroots electioneering that no local politician can ignore. After all, there are 100,000 or more gay men and lesbians in San Francisco. This is still a mecca for gays seeking escape from more restrictive attitudes elsewhere. Whether one likes it or not, the fact is that gay men and lesbians have become a powerful political force in San Francisco by virtue of their sheer numbers and voting strength and because of their political activity. What is less apparent is what they want to do with that newfound power and whether they can expand it outside the Bay Area. Oh, beautiful for standing tall against this sexist land. We're Gay politics focuses on a myriad of issues. Police harassment and hostility, immigration of gays, attempts by the likes of Anita Bryant and conservative Christians to defeat gay rights legislation, fundraising for sympathetic candidates, tactics in the battle for gay freedom, and violence, physical and verbal, against gays. But these concerns and countless others are mere footnotes to one clear overriding issue, defined here by San Francisco's only gay supervisor, Harry Britt. The great reality of life for lesbians and gay men is homophobia. The most important thing about being gay to me is not your sexuality, but, but having to deal with a society that simply cannot deal with your sexuality. And that's what homophobia is, is the inability of people to deal with people who are sexually different from themselves. On a practical level, gays deal with homophobia every day. On the streets, in the police department, at work, and in the halls of government. Violence against gays has become the top gay political issue. And in San Francisco, Mayor Dianne Feinstein, by virtue of her job, has become the most controversial politician in the eyes of the gay community. Violence against gays is rising angrily. You're realizing that the mayor you elected won't help you. Diane Feinstein, Diane Feinstein, Diane Feinstein, Miss Mayor, we mean you. To violence against gays, that it's not going to be tolerated in this community. The it's mayor holds power through her appointments to boards and commissions and by her control over the police, power that directly affects gays. At the same time, to consolidate that power, she seeks gay support for herself and her allies. Here, she proclaims Lesbian Gay Freedom Week and boosts the gay parade in which she has never personally participated. It's meant to be a jubilant experience, and it's meant to be, I think, within the bounds of good taste and uh, yeah, a minimum of problems, and so, so the people can celebrate the gains that were made and do so in a fun way. That yeah. sounds a good taste. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, as you know, I'm not a great one for seeing people going around the city nude, whether they be 
whether they be male or female, I just don't think it's appropriate. I'm a little bit embarrassed by it. Feinstein is often criticized by gays for not feeling comfortable with the whole subject of homosexuality. Gays attack her for what they consider her inability to control alleged police harassment of gays. And for firing Charles Gain, the only police chief the gays trusted. The weakest point in her administration is her dealing with the police, you know, police as far as the gay community is concerned. Uh, I guess most of my problems with Mayor Feinstein come out of her unwillingness to try to get more accountability from the police department to the gay community. The mayor defends herself by pointing to monthly meetings she holds with gay leaders and police officials. Committees have been formed to work along with the police department in terms of problem solving, breaking down myths and stereotypes, increasing understanding, seeing that the recruits are trained so that they have a better understanding of what the gay community is all about. Joe Daly, the lesbian Feinstein appointed to the police commission, has mixed feelings about the mayor's performance. I think she's got to come down a little bit, and I think she's going to, with a heavier hand on the police. Police problems and gay anger came home to the mayor dramatically of late when her own gay administrative assistant, Peter Nardoza, was arrested while simply walking with a friend in the Castro. Before I knew it, this police vehicle came around the corner, stopped, the two officers were out of the car, and the handcuffs were on me in a matter of seconds. Um, Gregory asked, why are you doing this? And their response was, you are drunk. And into the car we went. Were you drunk? I was not. One of the gentlemen who was in the car with us uh, alleges, and I believe it to be true, uh, that he was beaten. What do you make of this? I mean, wh why did they do this? My own opinion yeah. is that these two officers in this car this particular night simply wanted to pick up and harass gay men. Police allegedly harassing gays and police allegedly failing to protect gays when they are assaulted by anti-gay youths have led gays to form this street patrol, Community United Against Violence. The group advises gays to carry a police whistle to call for help from other gays. Its members use a walkie-talkie as they patrol the Castro, Polk, and South of Market areas frequented by gays. I was stabbed on my front doorstep coming home on New Year's Eve and was attacked and standing in line waiting to buy fried chicken uh, and another time was beaten as I stepped out of my office uh, after work. Are you convinced that it is definitely because you are gay oh, or I, look gay? I know it was. They were screaming faggot as they beat me. The situation at Collingwood Park is typical of what gays complain about. The park near Castro Street is used as a baseball field during the day but supposedly also as a place where gays have sex after the park closes at night. Police have made several dozen arrests for drunkenness or violating the park closure law. The gay community has complained bitterly, charging harassment and brutality. We do get complaints from the neighborhood about what goes on in the park, and the officers are sent in there to get people out of the park. The park problem and Nardoza's arrest prompted this community meeting attended by several city supervisors, where gays were encouraged to voice their complaints to the police. Among those who did was Gary Parker, president of the Stonewall Gay Democratic Club. And what we ought to do, as I see it, is to hold a mass rally at, at Collingwood Park and make a political statement across the city that, you know, stay the hell out of Collingwood Park unless you want to have a political confrontation with a whole lesbian and gay community. And I'll tell you right The now, overriding complaint not. here and constantly among gays is of homophobia among some policemen, an allegation serious enough to bring the chief to the meeting. We're here to talk about homophobia in the police department, and I'm not here to confirm or to deny it, but to listen to what you have to say. I know from dealing with the Police Officers Association that there is a great deal of homophobia in the Police Officers Association. Supervisor Britt had plenty to say. He organized the meeting, he says, because he has received hundreds of complaints about police action and attitudes. Take the case of Tom Cady. He had served as police chief in a small Kentucky town, had come out of the closet, and joined the San Francisco police as a recruit. I had people, other police recruits, come up to my face and tell me directly that they hated faggots, 
Under pressure from higher-ups, Cady resigned from the force after events like this during his field training. A sign appeared on the bathroom wall with my name on it. And uh, in quotes, it had my name and all faggots out of San Francisco. And this was capitalized in a surrounding uh, on each of the sides by kill all faggots. Katie says it's not just police recruits, but the entire police department, which, while not actively homophobic, condones anti-gay behavior. The police department has used their training program to weed out the minorities that they do not want. The women, the uh, blacks, the Ch Chicanos, the Chinese Americans, and uh, the gays. The department, of course, denies such accusations, defends response time in gay neighborhoods, and maintains it welcomes gays on the force who are mature enough to handle the job with professionalism. They come in with a chip on their shoulders. They fully expect this to happen. And when it doesn't happen to the d degree that they really have anticipated, I think they're rather disappointed. I really do. So when this one little very minor thing comes along. It's exaggerated and blown all out of proportion. If you can't stand a little ribbon, you better not come into this job. I'm very terrible when it comes to being ribbed, but when you're being harassed for eight hours a day, constantly, day in and day out, by 15 different training officers that I had, I think that's uh, overdoing uh, it just a little. Satisfying the police and the gays and others in the community puts the mayor on a political tightrope. She can't please everybody. Putting politicians in uncomfortable positions like that is part of the gay political strategy. For without pressure, gays have learned, politicians can ignore their demands and complaints. That lesson was taught to them by the most important figure in gay political history, Harvey Milk. Milk, who became San Francisco's first gay supervisor, deplored the fact that gays had no strong leader of their own, nobody who could really force an issue. Rather, he perceived, they sidled up to liberal politicians they thought might prove friendly or helpful. Milk, a transplanted New Yorker, one-time closet gay, former Goldwater Republican, changed all that. He wanted to make the politicians uncomfortable. Political consultant Jim Rivaldo started out as a volunteer for Milk. About, I mean, he was a pretty rough and tumble politician. He had enemies, he had friends, he rewarded people, he punished people. But he played the game in circles that gay people never before did, dealing with labor unions, dealing with the different power forces who operate in and around City Hall. And he did it with such style and such imagination that he really has inspired a lot of people. Milk learned the political game quickly. He tapped into the vast numbers of gays who were coming to San Francisco and congregating around Castro Street. His former lover, and now executor of his estate, example, Scott Smith. This is, this is a photo from the 1974 Gay Freedom Day Parade. Uh, Harvey, this was the Castro camera float. Uh, Harvey sold film and registered voters out of this shopping cart here. Winning elections for himself was Milk's immediate goal. Once you've won the election, you can get in there and you can voice your opinions, you can use the media as he did. Milk taught the gay political movement to shout. Listen as he fights Proposition 6, State Senator John Briggs' 1978 initiative that would have banned homosexuals from teaching in the public schools. I think a lot of people are going to realize they have to make an ultimate decision. The decision is to go back in their closet real good, slam the door tight, which some will do or burst down those closet doors once and for all and stand up and start to fight in any which way they can, organize, get involved. Milk's influence was incredible. He convinced a generation of homosexuals to come out of the closet and to act together in their own interests. He helped me to come to terms with my own homosexuality and, my, the, own, and the possibility that as a gay person I might have some power, that I might have some, some impact on this world. But on November 27, 1978, Harvey Milk was cut down by former supervisor Dan White, the same assassin who murdered Mayor George Moscone. Public mourning was deep. Outrage was intense. When White was convicted of voluntary manslaughter rather than murder, gays marched to City Hall and clashed with police in one of the city's most dramatic, violent, 
and memorable riot. It was a turning point for San Francisco's gay community. Were you there when our fury filled the night? We'll be there when they set the killer free. Harvey Milk caused the political establishment to sit up, take notice, and respond. Certainly, Milk discovered sympathetic political friends were necessary. But in addition, he preached, gays must strike out on their own, stridently demanding positions of leadership and power. Connie O'Connor absorbed that lesson. She's the president of the Alice B. Toklas Memorial Democratic Club, the oldest and most broad-based of the gay political clubs. So I'm not saying go out and support somebody who's a real Neanderthal that hates us, but if you find a good progressive candidate that you can work with and work for, I think that's wonderful. But I think we need yellers and screamers, too, out there really trying to disrupt the establishment, because those are the people, I think, that really make the social change more than the people on the inside. Jerry Berg is an active fundraiser for gay causes and practices law in a plush office off Union Square. What I found uh, for me, is that it works to work within the system. I'm a lawyer. Uh, you know, I go to court to change laws. I'm not effective on the street, street corners. However, I notice that some of my brothers and sisters are really effective. And I view that, that uh, as strange as it may seem, we're in partnership. Today, gay activists pursue diverse paths to power. This polite gathering is a $25 a head fundraiser for the Gay Rights National Lobby a Washington-based group which lobbies Congress for civil rights for lesbians and gay men. The approach is mainline political. We are responding with money in the campaigns that count to be effective against the new right and the moral majority. This gay group courts power mostly among liberal Democrats, their natural allies. And in a typical political trade-off, the same politicians court support from the gay community. Democratic Congressman Philip Burton of San Francisco, in a tough re-election campaign, puts in an appearance. Money, of course, talks in politics. That's what this party is about. But in the milk tradition, gays have not abandoned the street corner or the soapbox either. Yet, perhaps the most basic tactic of the gay political movement remains, registering voters. Political consultant Jim Rivaldo. Even on Castro Street, which is sort of like, you know, the gay Disneyland to a lot of people, uh, you can register more people to vote on the corner of 18th and Castro than you can anywhere else in San Francisco. Rivaldo and his partner Dick Pavich estimate that 50 to 75,000 votes in San Francisco are gay votes, an amazing quarter to a third of the total city turnout. Why such participation? It's gay people recognize that a large part of the reason why they are free to be relative, relatively free to be who they want to be in this city is because of politics. They don't stop at registering and voting. They join political clubs and march in parades. They volunteer in political campaigns and they attend meetings, endless meetings. And it pays off. The Harvey Milk Gay Democratic Club has become a major force not just in the gay community, but in city politics. Candidates ignore these activists at their own peril. They clamor for gay political club endorsements, which are printed up on slate cards and mailed or passed out to voters in gay areas. People uh, came up to the volunteers in the streets asking for one, and, and we're truly uh, interested in knowing what uh, the recommendations of the community leadership were. Straight office seekers have become so convinced of the power of the gay vote that for the first time in any congressional primary, a liberal Democratic candidate, Barbara Boxer, sent out campaign literature specifically targeted at gays. Boxer decisively defeated Mayor Feinstein's protege, Louise Rennie, who had also courted the gay vote, but less aggressively. Gay newspaper endorsements are also valued though they seem to have less weight than liberal democratic club support. Four Bay Area newspapers, all distributed free, cater to gay interests, not just in politics, but in fashion, culture, and sex. They routinely and in detail report the doings of the political clubs, and they keep political awareness high. Combined, they have a circulation of 65,000, 
evidence of an involved community. But at the same time, it is a diverse community, drawn from every region of the country and representing every economic, social, racial, and occupational sector. Gay socialists and gay capitalists, gay Democrats and gay Republicans, they coalesce into factions, and as factions always do, they fight. Conflicts of personality, jealousies, power plays, and genuine differences of opinion provide for intense discord. But despite the differences, the gay community's ultimate aims are united. Each entity is pushing for a more visible presence in government as part of the drive to secure gay rights. There have been some successes, some disappointments. Harry Britt sits on the Board of Supervisors, elected citywide, a symbol of gay power and influence. But he is the city's only gay supervisor and likely to remain so for a while. Joe Daly serves on the city's police commission, a lesbian activist appointed by the mayor. However, Daly sometimes gets criticized for being too cozy with the police establishment. Mary Morgan, another prominent lesbian, is a municipal court judge appointed by Governor Brown after plenty of pressure from the gay community. But she's the only gay on the bench in Northern California. And Sheldon Andelson, a millionaire gay businessman from Los Angeles, is a regent of the University of California. The very existence of this group is further evidence of gay clout. It's the Gay and Lesbian Committee of the San Francisco Human Rights Commission. Upfront gays have garnered jobs as aides to all manner of politicians and city officials, forming an unofficial network to keep an eye out for gay interests. Gay office holders like Brit increase their political capital by getting involved in non-gay issues like housing, where they can form alliances with other groups sharing progressive ideals. In terms of practical politics, gay Democrats have developed a working relationship with the Chinese American Democratic Club. The two minority groups need each other's help to elect their candidates. The issues that are brought up uh, by the gays certainly strikes a familiar chord in each one of us. And that chord clearly is a matter of civil rights. So it makes it very, very easy to support their candidate or for them to support our candidate. Other alliances are less developed but have political potential. Gay leaders wanting to ease tension between blacks and gays have founded the Pride Center in a former convent in a mostly black neighborhood. The center recently began a senior citizens lunch program. At this point, the labor movement, the Chinese community, the black community, all of the serious political players in this city understand that the gay community is part of the life of this city that you have to deal with. Even the Police Officers Association is making deals with the gays. Despite a long history of mistrust, leaders of both groups, together with a coterie of local Democratic politicians, recently announced an unexpected political settlement that could benefit both groups if the rank and file go along. The POA would drop its opposition to a ballot proposal championed by Harry Britt to create a civilian team to investigate complaints against the police. In return, Britt and his allies would support ballot measures to increase police pensions and overtime pay. Republicans are traditionally more circumspect than the Democrats in their support for gays and the progressive causes they espouse. But even the GOP comes to gays for support. Congressional candidate Milton Marks, admittedly a liberal GOP stalwart, is a familiar sight campaigning in gay bars along Castro and Polk streets, as he has done throughout much of his political career. Republican Marks and Democrat Phil Burton are battling tooth and nail for the gay vote. What gays hope for in return for those votes is support for gay rights on the legislative level. In Sacramento, Assemblyman Art Agnos, whose district includes the Castro, introduced in 1981 Assembly Bill 1, a measure to prohibit discrimination against gays in employment. We're just asking that gay people be able to work uh, free from any fear on the job of losing it because of what they do, by the way, in this state, which is entirely legal, uh, privately in their uh, bedroom. The bill was defeated. But Agnos will introduce it again. The problem in passing such statewide gay rights legislation, he says, 
is with legislators from outside San Francisco. They're afraid of the political ramifications that might come. Another problem, says Agnos, is that gay activists have concentrated their energies in the cities. I would criticize the gay lobby for not being as active in the state capitol. Right now, it's non-existent. Opposition to Agnos' gay rights bill came from a Christian lobbying group. In fact, many of the public attacks on homosexuals originate with conservative religious organizations who believe homosexuality is immoral or objectionable. Immoral, despicable, outrageous lies Religion has fostered and everyone buys The church says we're sinful and wrong in our ways Well, we say that's bullshit, we're proud to be gay the lobbying group opposing the statewide Gay Rights Act, headed by the Reverend W.B. Timberlake, attacked AB1 because it allegedly would have granted special privileges to gays. Deep down, I personally and most of our people are against uh, the, the bias toward the homosexual privileges, and that is perhaps an emotional issue way down having to do with family and, and the carrying on of the community uh, from, from generation to generation. Timberlake and many of his allies believe that gays choose their sexual preference and then unfairly demand state protection. It's just a great big club over the head of a person who comes in and says, look, I'm a homosexual, Here's my, here, this is my lifestyle, these are the kind of magazines I'll bring, uh, I'm applying for that job, and unless you can prove that I can't handle it, I will sue you for punitive damages. This is what happens in San Francisco and elsewhere, where they have this kind of ordinance. Timberlake has plenty of company in his condemnation of San Francisco for tolerating, even encouraging, the gay lifestyle. Gays, on the other hand, show their praise for the city by flocking here and enjoying a kind of freedom they haven't found elsewhere. For while gay liberation has made important strides around the country, San Francisco far outpaces other cities in granting gays the security to live the kind of life they want. But getting to that point wasn't by accident. It took strong and strident political action by gays organizing and hammering out tactics, often in an atmosphere of community intolerance. Today, gays continue that activism, for they know that many of their successes could melt away. Gay rights legislation, for example, could be overturned. And many of their goals are still unfulfilled. In most states, for example, it remains illegal for a gay person to have sex. But in San Francisco, at least, gays have won for themselves some major victories. For them, this city has become a symbol of what can be Amen. and an inspiration for gay political activity elsewhere. Beautiful for crimson skies, for squad cars bright with flame, for purple anger in the streets, and Mayor Watts her name. America, America, gays are oppressed by thee. We have to fight to make this country